Today's COVID update is brought to you by Fultech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. And welcome back, welcome back to Open Your Eyes. We're now moving into our first segment, and this one is actually part three of uh, breaking the, actually the political history and trends. Uh, we've got in with us Carolyn Trench Sandy Ford, who is a political analyst and so many other things. But today playing that role of political <laughs> analyst, Miss Carolyn, it's always nice to see you. Good morning. Good morning, John. Good morning, Marlene. It's always lovely to be and open your eyes in the morning. Yeah, definitely. It, even though it's a rainy, overcast morning, uh -huh. it's still a pleasure to be here. Definitely. But yeah, I'll tell you what, the political atmosphere is at this particular point very, very hazy. There are a lot of things going on. Uh, we could see what's going on in the far frozen north, or some people refer to it as Absolutely. Uncle Sam, the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the mighty USA. And I, I feel for the most part, there, there are definitely uh, some trickle-down effect uh, here at home. A lot of people were up actually watching this. I think you yourself. Not, not <laughs> I did, I I did watch eyes. some of it and then I realized, you know what, this is not going to happen tonight. So uh -huh. we'll take some sleep <laughs> because I had to get up early to yeah. be here with you this morning. <laughs> we're exactly one week away. And uh, you, you had your hat um, uh, some years ago uh, in the past in the barrel. So yes. what, what's the feel like for somebody who is anticipating uh, a win or anticipating election day, one week from the day? At this point, I would say, and we keep saying that 2020 is just so uncertain and so unpredictable that anything can happen. We've seen now that we have a parallel crisis of um, COVID-19, <clears throat> as well as the economic crisis that we do have. And then now we also have hurricane um, which is creating some flooding, um, flooding situation for us. So at this point in time, it depends where you are mm -hmm. and what are the key issues that are going to affect you to get out your votes. Your machinery by now ought to be in place and they ought to be not only robust, but it also has to have some flexibility in that you need to have by this time know exactly where you stand in terms of numbers. You know, we were talking a bit earlier it always boiled down to the numbers. What number do I need to win and where I am in terms of reaching that number? And numbers are linked to names. So you also have to start looking at those names as to see whether those votes are going to be affected by any of the issue that is now um, upon us, whether it's the flooding, whether it's the COVID-19, whether it's an issue of um, unemployment, whether it's an issue of not being in their constituencies, so there's a transportation issue. So there are many issues and, and those who um, are, are, are organizing right now, and those are the things that they have to start looking at. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I gotta say, so what's happening in the United States is a, is a great appetizer for us here. Um, in, in kind of getting the conversation started. And, and you have put together um, some great information for us to look at. You're starting off with looking at uh, the new demographic of our uh, voter population uh, since we have had or re-registration exercise. Let's jump right into it and, and talk about the ages of the persons who have registered. Absolutely. And now what you're seeing, uh, Marlene and John, um, clearly we are at 182,000 plus. And out of that, we have a very strong youthful population, 18 to 34 years. 43.1% uh, of that voting, that number of electors are going to be young people. And as we have mm. continuously said, young people um are they're more challenging to energize and motivate when it comes to the electoral process vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis those persons who are perhaps within that um 34 um to 45 and then that for um, 35 to 44 and then that um 45 going up because to a large extent those persons are more mature they are moving into that elderly um, age group and they have already been seasoned into the election process. Um, and to a large extent, those are coming out of the system of uh, being more uh, partial 
where you're either POP or a UDP, Mm -hmm. and where to some extent even the issues were not as diverse. Um, One of the things that um, John mentioned a little earlier when he was talking about the issue of COVID-19 and looking at the issue within the U.S. elections, Yes, COVID-19 is an issue. That was not an issue in previous elections. Mm -hmm. So it has added to some of the other issues, which would have been corruption, unemployment, um, and so on and so forth. But it is not even expanded. It also has a depth Mm -hmm. because, as John was mentioning earlier as well, different people look at it differently. One look at it from the pandemic, the health issue, how you're treating Mm -hmm. it vis-a-vis another who is looking at it from the employment issue i want the economy to open or how that um the fact that certain um sectors of the economy has been closed off and so i'm not earning uh, my, my 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 money uh-huh. and so the issue then for varying age groups are going to be um different and again like i always say politics is local what's happening in a particular constituency in one constituency may not necessarily be in another Mm -hmm. so knowing your demographics of course becomes very important yeah yeah now i mean you started off by saying it's almost like 43 just under 34. 43.1 percent that's right between 18 to 34 and a significant amount of those are new voters yeah um have never voted before and many of them have only known one government uh, because be mindful that we have a government that is in for 12 years. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things um, you we have discussed already, which in a previous segment where we were talking of some of the trends in the Caribbean, and as we're seeing um, within the US, the whole issue of the battleground constituencies, yeah. you're talking about governments that have been there for one term. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit different having a one-term government vis-a-vis a government that has been there for 12 years. Mm-hmm. That's um, right. How is it that people are looking at that component and who is it that have been around that have only known one government? That so is those such a are, valid you know, point, yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and, and you, then even you've said in the past, the though, sex, that that's not necessarily where the numbers are in, in who turns out to vote. Because these are... To be clear, these are the registered voters. Yes, um, these are the elected, right. Yeah. And so what you're going to have to start looking at is look at each constituency. Like I said, we, we, we boil it down to, and we were talking polling earlier, where we yeah. were saying, well, <laughs> is the polling wrong? Mm-hmm. But when you have national averages, you know, it's the same thing like with any, any average. Mm-hmm. We say to the country that the, the um, poverty rate is for the two point something percent. Mm-hmm. But then in some areas, you're going to see poverty maybe at 15 and 10 percent, while in others, it's 60 and 70 percent. Mm-hmm. So when you're looking at an average, um, you're not necessarily wrong in saying as, as what has been happening in the US where they've been saying, well, a particular um, um, candidate is leading. Mm-hmm. But when you now start drilling down and say constituency by constituency, um, for the U.S., it's the electoral votes. For us, it's the party that holds the majority of seats. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's 16. And so you have a scenario where, despite the fact that you are going to be 0-0 zero, zero on election day, you are still start have a starting point where the UDP, in our case, have 19 seats and the PUP have 12. Mm-hmm. For the PUP to form the government, they need to hold on to that 12 and they need to flip at a minimum four. four. Mm-hmm. UDP can only lose two. But if you look at that particular chart that we have done and we see where we have quite a number um, of um, what we would consider some battleground Brown, um, yeah. constituencies, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about um, about 15 or so battleground constituencies. And even that, and one of the reasons I did uh, constitu- constituency by constituency yeah. break down to show the trends is that even with large spreads, mm-hmm. which you would not consider a battleground constituency, you have still see people able to flip. Yeah. That's right. Those constituencies. So this is why we always say nothing is impossible yeah. when it comes to election. It depends on a lot of issues. There are some constituencies where you say high tide raise all boats. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so and you see those like 1998, 2008, you saw that. Mm-hmm. High tide raise all boats. They consider the, the um, elections in between those 
those individuals who were able to flip those constituencies, in some cases, there were some big flips. Yeah. So not because one say, oh, I have a spread of 47 or 55 or... Means it's a foregone conclusion. Yeah, it's a 61. Yeah. Means that that's cast in stone. No, nope, not <laughs> at know? all. And, and that's what I was going to get at, because even some of the, the, the battleground areas and... To be clear, what we are looking at is the uh, difference in percentage uh, between uh, those the the candidate that won or the party that won right. and the opposition from the twenty from the last election, the twenty fifteen right, election. 2015, that's so right. this isn't historic trends. This is trends from last election. Yeah, right, exactly. So you then even have to go and look at it then from the perspective of the constituency by constituency, yeah. because remember. It's the party that wins the majority of the seat yeah. that forms the government. So when we look at what you have here as a battleground, those that had the smaller margins for the win, uh, mm -hmm. some of these for before could have been uh, places where there were larger margins of exactly, victory before. Exactly. Um, and and the parties. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's also Absolutely. something to look at in. Um, knowing that it could be a change or a one-off thing that happened. Exactly. Uh, exactly. We'll see more and, on Wednesday, no? Right. And yeah. I think that is where I, I pulled out a few constituencies, which I okay. thought were interesting constituencies. And I felt we could maybe take a look very quickly at them and yes. to see what can happen in some of these constituencies. You're not saying, let it be clear. Yeah. 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 Um, all things are possible. Um, but at the end of the day, the numbers do play out in certain ways yeah. and it tells you certain things and it's how you interpret it and how you use it, whichever political party, yeah. Yeah. when doing their analysis, how they use it and what it is that needs to happen. You know, yeah. I've, um, uh, very interesting because uh, what we're seeing right now, especially in Stan Creek West, which was, which of course is a battle ground area uh, with mm -hmm. 0 0.12 from last election. And also what I've noticed in Toledo, let me see here, uh, Toledo West. Is it Toledo West? Yes, Toledo West with a significant 27.1%, uh, which is, of course, more than a 10% spread. These are, the, exactly. these are the folks that I, that I see a lot of gloating in. Um, for, as a matter of fact, uh, it was in the news that in Stan Creek West, there were uh, uh, parades going on in that particular area. Yeah. You know, and then also in uh, Toledo, in Toledo West, there were parades yes. as well. What does this Absolutely. say about uh, these parties? Uh, is it a fight or am I trying to show <laughs> color? Am I trying to show muscle? What's going on there? You have to show muscle, man. You have to show muscle. And, and, and image is everything. Optics is everything. Mm -hmm. even, if, even if at the end of the day, um, you, your numbers may not necessarily be playing it for you. Yeah. You will always have that percentage of independent voters mm -hmm. who you may want to make a shift. Mm -hmm. And when people, especially when you're moving towards the high tide raise all, mm -hmm. and you know you may get caught up in that and left behind, showing some muscles show that you're still relevant, that you're still vibrant, that you're still in the game. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. And not only that, it has been a tradition for us. Yeah. One of the things, for example, if you recall when, and, and, and this is just a comparison in the U.S., um, despite all the issue with Trump and they were talking about the fact that he's having these rallies and rallies, Trump understood his base. Mm. Yeah. He understood that his base needs to be energized yeah. and the tweeting by itself was not sufficient. He needed to bring them out. Mm. And they're the and people who wanted the uh, pre-COVID life. I mean, that's a exactly. very big factor exactly. for him. Those who want to go back to, to normal, as yeah. they call it, no? Yeah. Exactly. And so, like you said, if you go to some of the slides that I did, um, yeah. if we can take a quick look at some of them, we can see a couple things. Yes. Um, one of the first slides I did, for example, and I find this one to be, and all of them, they're interesting slides. Yeah. Um, if you look at one, we start, let's look at Albert. Albert mm -hmm. Division, if you go to the um, win, Albert Division has a 15% spread. Mm -hmm. Um. But if you go and look at Albert before 1998 and you look at Albert post-2008, what you're going to see is that the spread was 15% before 1998. Yep. It increased tremendously between 1998 and 2008. 
And by post 2008, it returned right back to 15%. 15%, mm -hmm. yeah. You see? Yes. So what that is basically telling you is that 15% of that population swung between that 1998 to 2008 based on whatever reason they did. But at, by post 2008, they swung back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what you're also seeing is that neither parties have grown that percentage if you look at 2012 and 2015. They're more or less still the same. Mm. So one would say, well, Albert has a 15% spread. That's hard. Mm -hmm. But imagine if that 15% that was linked or, or anchored between that 1998 and 2008 decide to flip to another yeah. side, it can flip. They, it can flip the blue back. Yeah. 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 Look at that. You see? <laughs> That's, but I, how do you put into, I mean, because we're looking at raw, we're looking at numbers, um, and there are always mm -hmm. other factors as well. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. So, uh, and we also have change in the, the personalities, the representatives exactly. that are put forward, and that can exactly. oftentimes have a, a big impact on the results itself. Exactly. And again, remember, we spoke again, keep saying the enthusiasm gap. Yeah. Am I enthused to come out to vote and who I am enthused to come out and vote for? Yeah. yeah. And personalities do play a lot in some of these constituencies. Um, we know that, for example, up to between 1998 to 2008, the Honorable Marcus Pat was the area rep. He won handsomely. He exited, and when he exited, Albert returned to normal, mm -hmm. if you can put it that way. It went back <laughs> to what it was before that, yeah. And if you go, and what we're seeing is 1993, but if you go to 1989 and 1984, you're seeing the same thing, the 55, average 55, 45. Interesting. Yeah. That yeah. is so, interesting. Yeah. yeah, so it's uh, 12 to 15, and that has been what it was, and it came right back to that. Now, again, that may say that the particular individual, ha there was an enthusiasm mm -hmm. that it was such that he was able to flip uh, uh, a voter base that, and not only flip it, flip it handsomely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because when you look at 2003, that was a significant spread. That was 68.8%. Wow. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. You know, right. I, I, so it's a it's a similar situation in, in Caribbean shores in returning right. back to 1993 numbers mm -hmm. based on the last Ex election. Exactly. But the different, a little bit different with Caribbean shores, uh, which I found, um, again, interesting. And if we can flip to Caribbean shores, because now remember Caribbean shores was a, uh, um, was a, uh, um, is more or less a battleground constituency, right. yeah. if you think about it, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's interesting, as we can see, and you're quite right, Marlene, in that um, in 1993, um, there was a win for the, um, for the at that time, the UDP, UDP. but it was by 1.6. Mm -hmm. And then by 2015, there's a win for the PUP by the say 1.6. That's right. But between that period, what you've also seen is where the, the, um, the PUP went as high as 55% to 43. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when it went back to the UDP, it went to 65 to 33. Mm -hmm. And the PUP went down, um, went down significantly. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the key things I noted with um, Caribbean shores, and, and, and this may be interesting, when you look at another slide, if you can flip the slide, if the, that, yes. the other slide, what you're going to see, and I pull this out to show to, 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 to define oh. something. Yeah. Remember, we spoke that you have two types of base, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You have one where if a thousand people go and vote, out of three thousand, you're talking about thirty-three percent go vote. But out of that thousand, if 600 vote for one party and 400 vote for the next, it's a 60 party. Mm -hmm. But that is out of who can vote. Yes. You can also look at it from the total amount who went to vote for a particular party out of the total number of electors, which would more or less give you a pretty, a, a better sense of what your base is, your base is. Yeah. Because that is telling you no matter what, that's your this minimum. percentage out of the total population is going to vote for you. Mm -hmm. 
And if you look at Caribbean shores, uh, wow. which again, I find rather interesting, yeah. what you're going to see is that up until the, the, the base for Caribbean shores is looking at 33.7. Mm -hmm. um, that was the lowest Caribbean shores ever went from the time it came into being. Mm. But in 2015, it went down to 31.6. PUP in 1993 was at 32.6. Mm -hmm. They came back up to 32.6 in 2015. But if you also look at the voting pattern for Caribbean shores, you're going to see a big drop between 2012 and 2015. 50.2% of the population came out to vote. So the yeah. base for the UDP was at its lowest, 31.6 in 20 in 2015, and even the the voter turnout was at its was lowest. lowest. Yeah. So that's telling you the UDP people the base most some more or less didn't come out in 2015, mm -hmm. but at a minimum most of the PUP did. That is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> But it's, 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 it's interesting in the sense also that let us, what's going to happen in 2020, uh -huh. again, it's local. Yes. Be mindful that you have a, a current year representative that has been very active. Um, um, even in opposition. Doing, yes, even in opposition, he's been very active. Yeah. But I think also what's playing, um, what, what has been playing uh, for him is that he also has a very energized and youthful um, campaign going on. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And remember, we speak of that strong percentage of young people. people. Yep. The more energized, the more motivated. Mm -hmm. And then you have a scenario where the UDP was not doing much for a period of time. So whether this would trend will continue, where the PUP will continue, yeah. or whether the UDP base will re-energize and yeah. come out, and if the current um, the the candidate for the UDP was able to sufficiently register, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. more people, because again, all of those things are going to play. Who is registering more people? Yeah. who have a more energized base and so on and so forth. But what came out of it, this voting pattern was to share, was to say, in 2015, the UDP base did not come out. Yeah. Wow. You know, so I, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm more quiet than usual, but when you put numbers in front of me, my mind goes, <laughs> what? <laughs> so what's interesting, interesting <laughs> to look at, too, if we look at the, the voting patterns, when the PUP wins in Caribbean shores, it's a smaller margin than when the UDP wins. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Absolutely. But there has and, been that and, and you as, as you quite said, it's like when they when uh, when they're at the the, the yeah. if you look at the two thousand and um nineteen ninety-eight to two thousand and eight drop, uh -huh. yeah. it's almost by half. Fifty to twenty four point eight percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. But well, when you see the UDP drop you know, it, 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 it's, it's not that much. It's only by 16, I think, or something yeah. like that. And it's also looking at that re-registration, uh, exactly. post-re-registration election, mm -hmm. um, exactly. where there is the high voter turnout and then that gradual decline. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So again, this is why as you, there are lots of factors that are going to play. You yeah. can't say how it's going to go. But these are some of the issues that if anyone within this constituency, they analyze their numbers and crunching their numbers, yeah. you have to take into consideration because it doesn't matter what Marlene and John, it's mm. a numbers game. Of course. <laughs> That's of what course. it boils down to. Let us take a look at Kaya North, yes. which again is right. another interesting constituency. And again, if you take a look um, at it, it is quite, um, it's up there in terms of the battleground. It had a 3% yeah. swing, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Now, Kaya North is rather um interesting in the sense that between 1993 and between and 2003 you're, you're going to see that there was not much disparity they were like just flipping mm -hmm. um one in 1993 it was 50 to 49 
by 1998 it went 50 to 48 um then it was 51 to 47 mm -hmm. which was in 2003, 2003 but yeah. by 2008 it widened out 62 to 34. that's a significant margin yep that's a that's a spread of almost 28 percent mm -hmm. but by 2012 they, they were able to flip it yeah even after yep. that big margin, yeah. That big, and that's the point I keep saying. Yeah. That if you look at some constituency, the margin is consistent. Yeah. Um, but if you look at others, even though you will see um, some back and forth thing, um, in in case like this, when someone and this was an off, uh, this was an affair, meaning that in two thousand and eight. Um, there was a there was a change. So you had a UDP and then in 2012, a PUP won it, even though they were not in office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so that, and then if you go back to 2015, you will see it went right back to that, that little spread of 5148. Wow. Um, so anything is possible. Yeah. And still, while they, they also had the notable decline in voter turnout, um, right. it's, it's exactly. still fairly high. But it's still high. Yeah. And even though I did not put in this, remember, there was also a re, um, a re a election yeah. took place um, early on in 2015 because the PUP candidate um, yeah. advocated his seat. So there was a um, by-election. Yes, a by-election. Yeah. But notwithstanding, um, you, you can take a look at that and you can see then why you can have a battleground, but at that battleground, you can have always, you can also see instances where even when it, uh, uh, um, a constituency is not a battleground, yeah. 20 odd, 30 odd percent, you can still flip it. Um, as you have clearly seen here, yeah. yeah right and it's also exactly. i mean how do we how do we put into consideration the sizes of of the um constituency itself um because uh, looking at the number of voters in Cayo north alone how does that um impact the the swing that you're talking about it won't in the sense if you look at the trends okay because you're still dealing with percentage yeah. okay so even if it's a thousand thirty percent of a thousand is 300 okay if it's three thousand thirty percent of it is you know is 900 so the if you look at the person because you win by percentage not numbers remember yeah. numbers translate into percentage so okay. i let me rephrase that you win by numbers but it's a percentage yeah, it's a percentage of people that you're looking at exactly. who went one way or the other. Yeah. The majority, and the majority is always represented in a percentage. 51 to 49. I win, you lose. Man, Carolyn, <laughs> we, we, we need you uh, on, on, the, uh, on the stage <laughs> with the touchscreen TV going yeah, through these constituencies oh my goodness, one by one. So Love you, set it up, <laughs> you set it up, Marlene. And let us take a look at Southwest again, which is again yeah. another constituency. Yeah. And I'm just throwing these out for, yeah. for us to look at it because Southwest again is another constituency where um, in 2012, mm -hmm. In 20, 2008, there was a big um, spread there. Yeah. You know, that spread was as a 16, um, 16, 17 percent. Yes. And then again, um, a candidate was able to flip it um, and it became 46, 45, mm -hmm. 46 in favor of the PUP, 45 in favor of the UDP. Yes. But be mindful, the per um, at that point, someone had um, the person, Campos, I think. Had yeah, Dr. Campos. Right, Dr. Compass, and he had 4% of the vote. <laughs> mm. And he is now running again. Wow. Yeah. You know, so these are, like you say, we talked about the locality of things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But even so, that they were able to flip a 17% in an off air for the PUP. Yeah. Okay. How, how, Which uh, again is, is, is a, go back to the point where I said nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. I'm looking Absolutely at Absolutely not. Corazal Southwest is, uh, is a battle, is a battle grown, uh, uh constituency again. And I'm looking exactly. at all these numbers. Now, Carolyn, uh, you know, and, and I, I really like when people get to understand these things. Now, how closely are political parties looking at all these battle grown? I mean, we've got 
five, ten, about twelve of them. Yeah. With nothing I over five percent. I would want to think that they are looking at them very closely, and I want to think that they are drilling down into the data yeah. very closely as well, because again, go back. Um, PUP needs four. Where are you going to get the four? Mm -hmm. um, and I use the word a minimum of four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. UDP can only lose two. Mm -hmm. Lose anything after that, they're gone. Mm. So in either case, you have to start looking. If you were PUP, then you start looking at where are these constituencies mm -hmm. um, that we can flip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where are our best chances? Where, are, you know, where, where, where does the probability exist, the higher probability? Yeah. Yeah. And then when you look at constituencies, for example, that are in the battleground, that you will see like Port Loyola, Caribbean Shores, pick stock. Pick stock yeah. mm -hmm. um, these are all constituencies, um, if you notice in the battleground, but they were all constituencies that did well for the PUP in the municipal elections. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. yeah. So uh, you would be looking at those. Um, Corosol, for example, was another one that did well. Yeah. Um, if you look at Dangriga, um, and I, I and I would want to for you to bring up Dangriga, which yeah. is again also um, uh, uh, an interesting one, and the numbers, of course, are very insightful. Yeah. Yes, because Dangriga, you would notice Dangriga had a higher spread. Mm -hmm. Dangriga's spread was seven point two yeah. percent. But if you notice again they with Dangriga. It's the same thing um, in the, the, the PUP um, lost in 93, won in 98, won again in 2003, lost yeah. um, 2008. in um, 2008. 2008. In fact, it lost, it flipped from 1998, it was 56 to 41. Mm -hmm. In 2008, it's 56 to 41. Mm. So, so it flipped right back. So they don't you have see? tight races. Uh, right. They, when they, they, they go one really... way, they go completely. <laughs> exactly. All right. And then, remember, in 2012, if you look at it, PUP again was able to flip that 15% um, or so mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, 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 and get a win by uh, 53. Yeah. So they had, a, um, again, 9% a, 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 um, or so. And then come 2015, that changed again. Yeah. So again i keep saying it that um if you look at these numbers you're going to see that nothing is impossible that's right uh, are we going to continue flipping up one in one out you know <laughs> are we going to take two sessions and then flip it yeah over time it's a trend it's a series you mm -hmm. look at it and again it will say a lot yeah but at it's the end a... of the day Go ahead. If numbers do play, they do play. You have to understand yeah. them. And as we were talking earlier, you have to drill down further. What is your age group? Yeah. Um, let us look at Dangriga. Mm -hmm. Dangriga have a large amount of voters who are, um, in fact, I think Dangriga is the, the area that has the highest level of remittance mm -hmm. coming out of the U.S. So they have a lot of voters that are not living in but Dangriga. But they also have a lot of voters who are in like the BDF, the police, yeah. those security forces and so. So again, when you start factor a lot of those things in, um, who will get the proxy to vote for people who are not working, you know, mm -hmm. how they will vote or they stick with. There's just so many variables. Of, of you course. Have to 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 <laughs> and, and when you look at, I mean, I, I, I appreciate especially the Dangraga slide because, uh, you know, when you were talking, when we look at the margins, mm -hmm. naturally, we'll say, yeah. okay, well, the one with the, the uh, who kind of inch their win are the easier ones to flip. Um, but that's yeah. not the case when we look at what, what the pattern shows in Dangraga. Exactly, um, exactly. And while so the pattern isn't a fortune teller, it gives us <laughs> an idea of how people behave in their voting yeah. practices. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah. I really appreciate that. Um, and if you look at it, if you look at that Greek, uh, you know, you will see, let us say, um, 20, between 2008, it was one, and by 2012, it was another, mm -hmm. by 2015, mm -hmm. it flipped back, will 2020 be flipping back to what it was in yeah. 2012? We'll see. <laughs> Absolutely. Let, let, so let me ask you personally, which one do you really have your eye on? 
You mean in terms of uh, the, the battlegrounds that we're talking situation? about? Yeah. <laughs> I, I I look at all of them, you know, and I always say <laughs> no one can predict anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but clearly they are battleground and a lot of things are going to play out come next Wednesday. You know, we've said this before, Marlene and John. We've yeah. said COVID-19, where are the battleground uh, constituencies and where are the um, areas that are highest hit by COVID? Yeah. If you're you're more you're elderly or your mature voters um, tend to be solid, yeah. and many of them wouldn't be able to come out. Or you know you have families who are very protective of their elderly, yeah. and are saying it doesn't matter. They're not going to go out there. Yeah. Um, you have, for example, if you go down south, they recently declared a state of emergency for two. I think they put well, not state. I think but two yeah. um, communities I'm, under quarantine. I'm glad you said that they're on curfew well, because. Pre-COVID, right. <laughs> we were talking about things like corruption and crime. Mm -hmm. Since COVID, exactly. clearly that's the number one conversation, but that's talking healthcare, that's talking economy, exactly. that's talking uh, reviving tourism, that's talking exactly. employment. Mm -hmm. Now you have in the South, we're talking about um, them being isolated for a curfew. You're yeah. talking about uh, what flooding may take place in the next few days. Exactly. And emergency so they response. Yeah. Exactly. So you have the flooding and then you also now have the, the issue curfew. of quarantine. And if yeah. you look at two of the villages, let us look at Bella Vista, which is one of the, the fastest growing village in Toledo East. Yeah. Toledo East is a constituency that um, had a spread at 3.7%. Yep. Um, Bella Vista is going to play a significant role mm -hmm. in, the, um, the, and they, in the village council. They went PUP. Yeah. yeah. And so they are going to play a significant role in terms of holding on to that yeah. to lead a seat. Yeah. So, so the thing is, nothing is impossible. It's how you begin yeah. from now. You asked earlier how you begin from now to organize and ensure that your systems are in place yeah. to get your voters out. You know, it, so it's interesting to see. Yeah, very. And, and that's the interesting part of uh, having uh, these conversations. This is actually part three. But it's interesting to see how parties are actually playing defense and how parties are actually playing yes. offense. You know, um, and, and that particular situation there in Bella Vista, which, um, which uh, is considered to be a PUP stronghold now with what's going on with the pandemic, is definitely exactly. a, defensive, um, a defensive scheme <laughs> that needs to be played there. But Carolyn, exactly. before, we, uh, before we started this morning, I asked you a question, and, and I'm sure a lot, it might be swirling along, uh, around in a lot of people's mind. Now, there are 31 seats in the House. Yeah. Um, if, if, if this election coming up next Wednesday, we should have a 15 for PUP, a 15 for the UDP, and for some miraculous situation, there is uh, an independent. What happens there? Both the PUP and the UDP will have to go with their hands and they, their hat in their hands to the independent mm. <laughs> because you can't form the government unless you have a majority yeah. so it's either you go to the independent or together you become the PUDP <laughs> meaning wow. that you you decide amongst yourselves that you will form the government a sort of coalition government mm. it would be a coalition government either way because it would be two political parties or political and an independent. Yeah. Yeah. But the point is, it will be a, a, a coalition. And so the coalition and be for either parties, there be which may be the easier route. Mm -hmm. um, the, or, or if you recall in 1993, um, there was going to be a reaching out. But even so, there's a cross the flow issue and these kinds of things. So at the end of the day, um, there's a whole, it, it, it can become an interesting uh, pathway yeah. if that was supposed to happen. Well, what I love- But a coalition government obviously can be formed um, and, and that has happened in the past. The difference would be that when we've had a coalition um, government in 1993, they agreed to be a coalition before the election. Mm. In what you're speaking to, it would be, be becoming a coalition after the election yeah. and so that for that in that um, independent um person who would have won will have, would have to say it or have yeah. given intent to the governor general that they are supporting that particular leader for him to become the prime minister because remember the governor general appoints the prime minister and the governor general will only appoint the prime minister if he in his view and opinion 
believes that, um, or it appears that a particular person has the majority, the, the support of the majority of people in the house. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Well, there you go. One, one possibility. And you know what? <laughs> it's 2020. Some people will say it's far-fetched, but it's 2020. <laughs> Anything can happen. <laughs> Anything can happen. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's what this year is known for. Carolyn, it has been so interesting. This has been a, a three-part conversation <laughs> diving into uh, the roles and looking at voting patterns in the past. Um, of course, we continue this conversation starting next Wednesday uh, when we start our coverage for Decision 2020, and we will see what this very unique year will bring. Thank you so much for the conversation this thank morning. You, Absolutely, and thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. All right, always looking forward to a uh, conversation with Carolyn, political history and the trends. That was actually part three. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a break. But when we come back, we'll be uh, going, uh, let's call it still uh, in the political atmosphere. But this one is actually a review of Belize's economic performance from 1998 to 2019. We'll discuss that when we come back. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltex Systems. Your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service.